fruit of faithfulness. I know we kicked one out of order here, but again, the snowstorm uh, in early January kind of threw things out of whack. But that's okay. And then next week, uh, our missionary will be sharing on self-control, the last of the fruit of the Spirit. So, if you would stand with me this morning, we're going to look at two passages of Scripture. We're going to look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and Galatians 2, 20. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. In Galatians 2, 20 reads, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. I pray that it would go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, speak to us this morning through your word. And I pray that we would be men and women of faith. And that, God, we would serve you in faithfulness. And I just ask now that your anointing and your, your word and your blessing would just touch our hearts and our spirits in such a way that it would show us, Father, and, and lead us in, uh, in this life of faithfulness. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to uh, read here um, a, a quote. It says, While the Christian life takes place in the flesh, it is nonetheless lived by faith. Not only are we justified by faith, but we also live by faith. This means that saving faith cannot be reduced to a one-time decision or event in the past. It is a living, dynamic reality permeating every aspect of the believer's life. As I was preparing the message for this week, and I've been looking forward to this message, uh, probably, uh, not that I don't look forward to all of it, but I, when I look at the fruit, um, and we got out of, out of line and got out of the schedule, I thought, oh, I wonder if Ken's going to want to keep things in line, and if he does, he'll take faithfulness from me. And, and I love this, this topic. Um, I have recently had to do some research on this and write a paper on, on the role of faith in the early Pentecostal movement in the 20th century for the first 50 years and how the Pentecostals viewed faith. And, and so um, there's just, I had so much in my mind just kind of spinning around. I said, Lord, I, said, I need to gather all this up into something that's, that's uh, um, understandable for me. Um, because if I can't understand it, how can I relate it out to you all? So, but in the process of doing so, I, you know, I just, I, I looked at the scriptures and I looked at some things and, uh, and considered a lot. And then I got to, the, to thinking about it and I realized that, um, that this quote here is important for us because we talk about ourselves as being people of faith. And again, the church as a whole and the early Pentecostal movement, this was a key, key element of the Christian faith, of the Christian law. They, they, were, they saw themselves as people of faith. And so uh, with that in mind, I thought, well, you know, let's, let's take a look at this a little bit. Let's understand faith. And there's some things I'm going to share. They kind of came up a, a little bit in Sunday school this morning on some ideas and some stuff that will go into the, the handout for the home groups this week. Uh, hopefully, you know, that you'll be able to build on this as well. But in this morning's passage, the Apostle Paul reminds us that faithfulness is not a verb. It's a noun. And so when we look at this, and this is true of all the fruit, by the way, um, and I think I mentioned it before, but I just want to make this point that these are not action words. These are words that tell us who we are and what we believe. So it's not that I, I have faith as an action, but I am a person of faith. It's who I am. It's who the Holy Spirit makes me to be when I walk in the Spirit. And I do believe it's important for us to understand the difference. Um, I've spoken with people in the past, as probably many of you have, and they, a person will say, well, yes, I have faith. Okay, when they make that statement, really what they're saying is, I have faith because I've received something that is an action, it's what I do. And yet at the same time, when troubles and trials come their way, it seems like their faith begins to crumble. Uh, I used to use the, uh, kind of the illustration that Jesus says you only have the, about faith what, the, as the size of a mustard seed, right? The tiniest of all seeds. And yet, while this is all that's required, I, I think sometimes people have what I like to refer to as watermelon faith. Okay? And they may even have double watermelon faith. It's like their faith is like a big shoulder like this, and they're carrying it around so everybody can see it. And as soon as something trips them up or trials or tribulations come their way, their faith falls and shatters and goes into a million pieces, and it's all over the place. 
And then their faith is no more because it served no purpose as far as how they see it. Now, I think it's important for us to realize that, that this is the faith that I express in words. Jesus says, this is the faith that you need in your life. And there is a big difference between the two. Um, as we look about this and we consider this, well, I want you to realize that it is not what we do in the spirit that makes our faith, but it's who we are in the spirit. We are, as the, again, the early Pentecostals used to say, we are men and women of the faith, people of faith. Not that it's what we, how we are, but what we do, but who we are. Richard Longenecker puts it this way. The Christian life is a life lived by faith. Its basis is the faith or faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Its response is that of a commitment of belief. And its atmosphere is one of wholehearted faith and trust. Now, I found this quote here, Longenecker, and I thought to myself, wow, I love these three points, and they're really what I want to look at this morning. So, you know, he gives us the foundation for what I want to talk about today. In these, it is these three points which he makes that will be the focus then of our message this morning. Uh, for us to know the basis, the response, and the atmosphere of faithfulness. And that's what we're going to do today, is to know how to properly live. So let's take a look at these this morning. And the first thing we'll look at, of course, is its basis. Faithfulness basis. You see, it is the basis of it, its basis is the faithfulness of Christ. When we talk about faith, we often talk about our faith. But our faith would be nothing without Christ's faith. It is Jesus Christ who, in, who was faithful to the Father in completing the task that was set before him. And he remains faithful today in upholding his promise and what he has promised to do for each and every one of us. So with this in mind, we need to realize that Jesus Christ was faithful to his mission, giving himself for all. Now this, this says a lot for us because what it shows us is his was a mission that sought to bring redemption to fallen humanity. And it required his faithfulness in order to accomplish the task. He had to remain faithful to the Father, faithful to the call, faithful to everything that he did. And so he becomes our example of faith. Jesus' faith was a, a life of faith. His was not just the actions of faith, but a life. It, if it, his, his life was only embodied in just actions, if his faith was only embodied in just actions, like we sometimes see, then it would, it would have probably, I want to say this, he probably would have struggled a lot more with getting to the cross. Because eventually his faith would call into question the Father's will. But as he, as he prayed in the garden and he sought the will of the Father, um, and he made that statement, you know, your will, not my will be done, that is a prayer that says, right now in the flesh I'm struggling, but I have faith that you will fulfill your purpose. And I'm trusting, I'm walking with the Father, I'm walking in you, Father, to see this purpose fulfilled. You see, in spite of the circumstances he faced, he continued to give everything he had for the purpose of the call. Jesus Christ is our basis for faith. Jesus Christ is our basis for faith. So what we see here is that, is that if we look at him as an example, we find an example of faith. Now this morning in Sunday school, we did a little topical study, and I gave the class a handout. We did a topical study on faithfulness and different types of faithfulness, human faithfulness, God's faithfulness, and then even there broken down into categories. And I said just we had scriptures grouped with those. <clears throat> One of the things we did not have in there was uh, Jesus' faithfulness. And yet, how many times do we see in the Gospels his life called into question, but he remains faithful to his call, his purpose, the Father. Jesus Christ's life is a prime example for us of a life of faithfulness. And so he becomes our foundation. Why is, why is this basis important? Because if, if not, if our, if our faithfulness is grounded in us or others, those apart from God, we are, we are setting ourselves up for a fall. I mean, uh, I, in the past, I, I just you know, can't think of an, ex an exact illustration of this in my life, but there are times when people say, well, don't you have faith in me? And you say, well, sure, I have faith in you. Maybe you know, you're know talking about something or whatever, and then they don't come through. And what does that do to that faith? Okay? They weren't faithful in their promise, and so your faith in them now is, you know, crushed. 
But Jesus Christ, never we never find him in a situation where what he promised to do, he did not fulfill. And so he, if we see that, we see that he is faithful. Now what this means for us, of course, is that he was faithful in life. He was faithful in death. He was faithful at the resurrection and the ascension, uh, which we'll be celebrating here in a couple weeks. And he's also faithful in the fact that he promised he will return for his church. And who is he returning for? Men and women of faith. He's looking for those who follow his pattern, who fulfill his purpose in their lives. I, I was reading some quotes from Billy Graham uh, yesterday. And I, I know I'm going to get this wrong because I didn't write it down. That's my mistake. But he said something once along the lines of, uh, uh, you, for some people, you may be the only Bible they ever read. Was something along that line. And I thought about that. Okay? And uh, forgive me if I totally you know, tore that up in this quote. But the idea, the premise is still there. The idea that, you know what? If, if people are watching us as people of faith, they're not necessarily watching what we do. They're watching who we are. And who are we in Jesus Christ? How are we living our lives for Jesus Christ? And this gets us to the second point, which is its response. Its response is one of commitment and belief. Now understand here, it's not just committing to Jesus Christ, but believing in that commitment. Our response of faithfulness is believing what Christ did for us. My response, my acceptance of Jesus Christ, while it's important to understand what the scriptures and all that say, it goes down to one thing and really one thing only. That he made a promise to me that he's going to keep. And that is that if I accept him as my Savior, he, I am restored to my relationship with God. All the other things will hinge on that, that relationship. Now, how can I accept something like this, even though we look at it as historical fact in scriptures and throughout other, other historical documents, possibly, even though some would question his divinity in those documents. But I, I pick up God's word and I look at it and, and realize this, that the only way I can accept what's being said there is by faith. I mean, we're going to get into the, the Easter season, and as we get into the, this season now, there's going to be like, you know, Discovery Channel or History Channel or one of those, and some of the news networks will start to run. Um, I think last year, around this time, uh, the Today Show ran like a whole whole series for a week of, of, of little vignettes or whatever you want to call those things, where they talked about people's faith life. And it wasn't just Christians, it was about there were people of faith or whatever in church and stuff like that. And, and this becomes, for about a week or two weeks, faith becomes, the faith life of people becomes a, a focal point in our culture because of the event. But the week afterwards, all that's left standing are people of faith. Those are the ones that have looked and said, you know what, I believe and I trust that what Jesus said is true. I'm, I'm going to accept it, I'm going to agree with it. My response is a commitment of belief. I believe in Jesus Christ. Now there are there are creeds out there, things like that. I teach a class on, on church history, and, and uh, you know we, we look at some of the creeds and things that, that have been established. And uh, some of the I was teaching a class this week, and we were talking about some of the liturgy and some of our old the, the more mainline churches, what they recite every week. Of course, you know uh, we don't do that because it's not spiritual. All right. That's what some would say. I've heard Pentecostals say that. Well, we don't cite creeds. We don't cite, you know, different things like that. Or we do reflective readings because they're, they're not spiritual. Uh, and yet, at the same time, we have to redefine spiritual in our own minds. Um, but in understanding here that, you, you know, it's this idea of committing and believing is not about what we read or how often we read it or whatever. It's about our, it's about our faith relationship. It's about us and Jesus Christ. It's you personally and your Lord and Savior. And what you're doing in your life, how you're living for Him. And it begins by believing in what He did for us. Okay. It, it is interesting we get to this point where we're so close to Easter when we get to this idea of what did Jesus Christ do for me? It was faith. We were talking about um, <clears throat> something came up last, last week with the classes and, and 
uh, Thomas came up, and I, I know I've shared this before, but still it's the idea that when we think of Thomas, poor Thomas, the doubter, right? Isn't that what calmed down in Thomas? Gets all the bad press? Okay? But yet, when it was time to go to Jerusalem, wasn't it Thomas that said, well, Jesus is going to go, go die, let's go die with him? Come on, guys, let's go. Grab your swords. Our Lord's going to die, we're going to die with him. We overlook that for the negatives. Okay, and, and so we find these, these illustrations. And so we would look at Thomas and say, well, Thomas wasn't a man of faith. Because why? Because he doubted the resurrection. I really think what he said is, listen, I want my Lord to be alive, and I'm not going to accept a, a counterfeit. Show me the real thing, and, and I'm, I'm with you. Okay? I don't think it was so much a matter of doubting. As a matter of saying, you need to prove it to me. I'm not going to take you at your word. Only my Lord can show me it's my Lord. And so, but then when they'll say other things, and we say, whoa, okay, wow, this guy, man, great man of faith. Okay, he's going to go out and do that. Um, but again, the idea of the response that, that, that takes place here, what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to respond. respond. You see, it's not just a response that seeks to protect one from the inevitable justice of God. Sometimes people see uh, the faith life, accepting Jesus Christ as, as kind of a fire insurance. I can say it that way. Okay? Their faith is not wrapped up so much in the fact that they have faith as the fact that I don't want to go here, so I'm going to do what I can to go there. And it's not really deep in its relationship. Uh, it, it is a response, however, to a committed faith, to the fulfillment of all God has for each individual. As when, when Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness, what he's saying here is, uh, as with all the other fruit, as the we, you must be faithless. You just have to, you have to walk in it. And it. It has to be you each and every day. Walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, so to speak. And so that's important that we understand that. That's what God's called us to do. The third thing we see here then from response is we go to its atmosphere. This is the third, uh, Long Necker's third point. Uh, it's an atmosphere of, what I want to use here is the word wholehearted trust wholehearted trust. Now, understand, in the previous one, I had the word commit, commitment and belief. And in the original, in the, in the Greek language, the same word could be used for believing and trusting. So belief and trust can be the same word. Now, why do I make that point when I'm talking about faithfulness? Because I've heard people that say, I believe in Jesus, but their life do not, does not embody trust. You understand what I'm saying? Because trust requires faithfulness when it comes to God. Well, I'm facing a situation here, and I believe that God will fix it. But do you trust Him to do so? To the point where you have enough faith to keep your hands off the situation and let Him take care of it. There is a difference. That's why it's wholehearted trust. You see, our life of faithfulness is grounded in this unwavering belief that there can be no shifting sand, so to speak, under our feet. It must, we are built on the sure foundation that is Jesus Christ. That goes back to the, ba again, the basis, the, 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 the very foundation of who we are is not us, but Christ. And what we live, and how we live, and what we do, our life of faith, our, our faith walk is one that is unwavering in its belief. I cannot say, you know what, I have faith that God will do this, but I have trouble having believe, believing that I have faith enough that God will do that. <clears throat> Why would he do one and not the other if he is consistent? Our faith must be unwavering. We cannot find ourselves uh, caught in believing yes here, no there. And that's hard for us because we live in a world where we find that yeses and noes kind of fit into what our life has. Okay? Someone promised to do this, they came through. Someone promised to do that, they didn't. This yes, this no. Well, if it happens here, then it happens with God. No. You know, it's interesting, you know, we were kind of kidding around here before the service about the whole time change thing. And, um, and the fact that some should be showing up about any minute now. Uh, but the idea here is, and I've told my students this before, I said, you know, God didn't create time for himself. He's eternal. He created time for us. 
so that we can measure the days and the hours, maybe until Jesus comes. I don't know, but, but the idea is, you know, we needed to have this for ourselves so we'd know when to go to sleep and when to change the clocks and stuff like that. If we had to have, <coughs> you know, if we didn't have time, we wouldn't have to change our clocks. We would just get up when the sun went up and whatever. But I say that to say that, you know, God works in a different realm than we do. We work in the realm of time. He works in the realm of eternity. We work in the, the realm of, of joy and sorrow, depending on who we're dealing with. He works in the, in the realm of, of the heavenlies where all, he, he, wants to, he wants to heal that joy. And he wants to you know, bring that joy and heal that sorrow and, and lift us up. And, and our faith cannot be rested in what we see within this world and humanity. It must come from an un, unwavering, wholehearted belief that, G, that God will accomplish what he's promised through Jesus Christ. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and I pray each and every one of you have, but when you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it was a faith moment in your life. It was nothing else. You know, the, the, the whole event itself required you to say, I believe in faith that what, this, what I'm experiencing right now is true beyond a shadow of a doubt. That Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died for me, he went to the cross for me, and if I ask him to be my Lord and Savior, I am forgiven of my sins. Now, while that's a very strong faith statement, that is a life statement, because our lives are changed, not just our actions, but our whole being, we still struggle with letting go of the sin. We still struggle with the ability to be able to forget. And, and because we can't, we think God can't. So I say all this to say, that, to understand here that uh, it, this is grounded in this unwavering belief that what God has promised, He has done, and what Christ has said is true. This is not the belief of salvation, that faith moment, that we, that, but a faith that is empowered. It's trust. It's enabled by, by trust and belief. It's not, you know, we have that faith moment in salvation, and that faith moment needs to lead to a faith life. A faith life. It's who we are. It's where we go from that point on. Do you believe what happened at the altar, if that's where it happened? Did you leave believing? Do you still believe as strongly today as you did at that moment? Or has, our, has your faith kind of wait, you know, waned a little bit? Dropped off? You find yourself struggling in faith. What we're struggling with is the action of faith because we're not living the life of faith. Now, I want to be careful here because I, I don't want to make it sound like faith is just this all, all and everything. It's the only thing we need. That's not true. Okay? There are some people that have corrupted the concepts and the ideas of faith um, scripturally. And that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am saying here is, is that faith is who we are. But you know what? So is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, self-control. All of them are who we are. That's why it's the fruit of the Spirit. Not the juice. Not what comes out after we squeeze. <coughs> well, I just thought of that. That's pretty good. I think I'll market that one. The juice of the Spirit. No, anyway, understand that it is a daily walk experience. <coughs> That what the Son of God has done for me encompasses all of who I am and what I do. It's not just what I do, it's who I am. So what does all this mean? In our Galatians 2 verse, Paul states, quote, The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Stuart Briscoe is careful to point out that Paul's reference is to the whole self and not a war that sets the flesh against the spirit. He notes, quote, there is a kind of pathos for Paul in, his, in, in this word flesh, because he's talking about the creative, creatively transient, vulnerable, contingent character of life. What he's saying here is there is this part of me right now that can, that can find myself lacking in faith, that can find myself lacking in love. If I allow the flesh to be what guides me, I will stumble, I will struggle, I will fall. But if I walk in the Spirit, all these things remain evident. It is God's desire that each one who calls Jesus Lord and Savior 
would seek to set aside the things of the flesh for the glory of the Father. That's what he's called us to do. That's who he wants us to be. To do this, one must walk in the Spirit. Faithful is he who we are and not what... I'm sorry, faithful is who we are. It's not what we do. Now, that's not to say that we don't have acts of faith. I want to clarify, but realize this. Like so many other things that we've talked about with the spiritual fruit, there's this action that we can do that isn't really bound up in the Lord, in Scripture. There's the joy that is emotional compared to the joy that is spiritual. There's the peace that I have when things are going good and the peace that I have in times of turmoil and tribulation, one of the flesh, the other the spirit. There's the faith that I have when I can see things and I know that the outcome is probably going to happen the way that I think. Is that really faith? And there's the faith that you step out and say, it doesn't matter how things turned out because my trust, my faith is in the Lord. And if we understand that, we understand that there are times we don't get what we think we should because God knows better. And that's hard for us to take. That's hard for us to receive at times, but it's there. It's true. <clears throat> it's who we are, not what we do. So this morning, in closing, is your journey one that takes you along the path of faith? It should be. We should all be there, right? It's our lives. Is your life one of complete and utter faith? Do you find yourself thankful for what God has done and say, this is my life. I trust in the Lord. I have faith in Him. Is its basis found in Christ? Or in self-proclaimed, or is it a self-proclaimed faith? Is, your, is the basis for your faith a Christ faith basis? Christ, yeah, Christ, that's it. Uh, and not something that's just self-proclaimed and I walk around, look how much faith I have, look how much faith I have. Again, we, we, we've all seen people that do that until something kicks their feet up from underneath them. And then their faith just crumbles. Is its response one of commitment? I'm committed to walk in the Lord. I'm committed to this life of faith. Or is it one of convenience? I can't handle I, You know, I, I just, in my mind, I think, okay, I'm facing a situation and I have no power now to handle this. Now I have faith in God. Why don't we have faith in Him in the little things? As a matter of fact, I think there's a whole parable about having faith in the little things. Because if you're not faithful in the little things, right? Let's start there. Oh, I can handle this one. I really don't need to have faith in God in this. I can handle this. Put your faith in. Trust me. Walk it. Is its atmosphere one of unwavering belief or is it contingent upon the moment? Depending on just what we're facing right now as to whether or not. These are the questions we have to answer this morning. These are what we have to reflect on personally. It's basis, it's response, and it's atmosphere. So as we prepare to close, I'm going to ask everyone to get by your heads. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to be able to speak now as, and to move as only the Spirit of God can. And for some of you this morning, maybe it's the basis. It's the basis of your faithfulness, your faith found in Christ. Or do you find yourself struggling with the idea that, you know what, the Holy Spirit has shown me that most of what I do when I move in the realm of faith is self-proclaiming. But I don't want that anymore. I don't want faith to be something I say. I want it to be who I am. If that's you this morning, I want to pray for you anyone at all. Amen. Now, maybe your response is one of commitment. Are you walking that life of faith unwaveringly, believing, trusting in God? Or do you find that your faith only comes out as a matter of convenience in those moments when you need it most? Is this a faith life walk for you? If, if you say this morning, Lord, I want this to be a faith life walk. I don't see that it's this way all the time. I want this to change. I want my response to be a response of faith. If that's you, I want to pray for you anyone at all. Thank you. Any others? Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, it's atmosphere. Unwavering belief or in the moment. Somewhat of the last one, but realize that last one is dependent upon our relationship with Jesus Christ 
and accepting him as Savior and walking in that. This one here, while Christ is still part of it, what we do find is, yes, I have faith and I trust Jesus wholeheartedly, but if I can do it myself, I'm going to. And God's saying, give it all to me today. Give me the little things. If you're facing a little thing right now, that the Holy Spirit is saying, you know what, God wants to take this from you, and you want to, and you're willing to respond and give it to Him, I'm going to pray for you. Anyone at all? Thank you. Any others? Thank you. It's the little things that we begin with that make a difference. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in this church and in our lives. And we thank you, Father, that you have called us to be men and women of faith, faithful to the kingdom, faithful to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Lord, not, not just to be faithful in action, but to be faithful in life. Holy Spirit, minister to each and every one present. To those that raised their hands this morning and said, Lord, I just need a, a, a fuller measure of your Spirit that I might, I might live this life of faith. Not just act on it, but the Father will become who I am. That people would see the faith of your spirit present in my life. And I just ask now that you bless each and every one. Be with those that aren't here this morning, maybe because they were just too tired because of the, the time change. I pray you bless them, energize them, energize everyone here as well, and restore us, Father, and, uh, and just give us the fullness of your presence. For those that might be sick, touch them, lift them up out of their sick beds, Lord, and strengthen their bodies. And for others that just, they had other obligations, the desire to be here but weren't able to do so. <clears throat> we know, Father, that you are not limited by four walls. And so, Lord, I pray now that your spirit would minister to them and they would still feel the fullness and the power of your presence in their lives and the joy that comes from experiencing you. And may all of our lives be embodied by faith. Go with us now, we pray, and keep your hand upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Again, if you're writing...